So we elongated Musk bought Twitter, and that's apparently a victory for free speech advocates, political outsiders, and those who want Donald Trump to be free to post more thirst traps of his massive dump truck. Uh, I can't really blame that last group, that thing is... Thick. Musk has been critical of Twitter's policies for years, arguing that the website has overreached its bounds with content moderation and that the site has a bias against the political right, even though all the empirical evidence we have points to the opposite. Musk has gained a significant amount of support from supposed free speech absolutists who argue that social media sites are governed by Silicon Valley big tech elites who are using the platforms to censor their political opponents. So naturally, the solution to this problem is the private ownership of one of the biggest social media platforms by a billionaire tech entrepreneur who has a history of silencing his own critics. This man is the key to the global working class having a voice on the digital town square. Look, I'm not saying Twitter is perfect. I don't even like Twitter. With respect to the people who find comfort in the communities they've developed there, Twitter is a garbage website designed to concentrate and amplify the worst parts of social media while straining out, like, 90% of its benefits. Nor am I saying that Twitter's content moderation policies don't need iteration and progression. I'm all for making changes to make the site a more productive place for political discourse. But is this the guy that's gonna make that happen? Now, I could talk about Elon's history of silencing speech from his critics, former employees, and partners, or criticize his tenuous grasp on the concept of censorship as it pertains to the First Amendment and private companies like Twitter, but I feel like we've seen that video before. I want to take a different approach. I want to give Elon the benefit of the doubt and take him at his word. He genuinely wants Twitter to be the public town square, a place for productive political deliberation that serves democracy, and that, in his view, holding Twitter to the standards set by the First Amendment is the way to get there. But the thing is, he's wrong. In March of 2022, Musk tweeted the following, Given that Twitter serves as the de facto public town square, failing to adhere to free speech principles fundamentally undermines democracy. Now, social media's influence on 21st century politics can't be understated. But if Musk does care about using a platform that upends free speech ideals as a means to reinforce a functioning democracy, well, is Twitter even the right platform for that? Musk's assertion that Twitter is the de facto public town square is a reference to a concept by German philosopher Jürgen Habermas's idea of the public sphere. Habermas's public sphere was defined as a place where people could be free to discuss societal issues in an open form, debate them, and come up with a public consensus that could be used to influence political movements. Habermas laid out a set of criteria for useful political deliberation. Useful meaning discussion that would actually lead to political action. While there's certainly merit to political discussions for their own sake, and even Habermas himself acknowledged how these are merely ideals, I believe I believe this framework is useful when discussing Elon Musk and Twitter. Because I have to assume Elon dropping $44 billion to purchase the platform is out of a desire for it to serve as a means to facilitate useful political discussion that will contribute to societal change and not the impulse purchase of a thin-skinned billionaire with a Twitter addiction. The ideal public sphere would be free from state and economic influence. Despite whatever shallow mission statement a corporate executive might drop, all these social media sites have one common goal get you to stay on the platform longer so they can show you more ads. As these sites have become more popular and profitable, content moderation on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter is largely dictated by the standards of their advertisers, and each platform makes the bulk of their revenue from ads. To be fair, Musk has addressed this, stating that he isn't worried about economics or using Twitter to make money, and that he wants the platform to become less reliant on advertisements. Now, I don't see how letting one billionaire decide what can and can't be said on Twitter is better than advertisers making that decision, but I also have reason to doubt Musk's statement here. Musk's buyout of Twitter was largely made up of debt from Morgan Stanley and loans from venture capital firms like Anderson Horowitz. Musk's pitch to investors was that he could easily double or triple their investment, increase Twitter's user base, and double the company's revenue by 2025. 
Elon himself may not care about making money, but he still has an obligation to his investors to make sure Twitter is a financial success. A dramatic shift away from Twitter's main source of revenue poses a huge threat to Twitter's bottom line, which is no doubt something Musk has to consider in order to appease his investors. Musk coming up with a solution that would grow Twitter at the rate he promised his investors might not even be possible without advertisers. And as long as there are advertisers, Musk's free speech absolutist values will have to be pushed aside, unless he thinks he can sustain Twitter on alpha brain and blue chew pop-ups. While Musk does have ideas for alternative revenue streams, many of his pitches have been tried by other websites. While Infowars and Parler have managed to create successful platforms without the support of mainstream advertising, their revenue pales in comparison to Musk and his investors' aspirations for Twitter. Habermas also cites inclusivity as a core tenet for useful political deliberation, stating, However exclusive the public might be in any given instance, it could never close itself off entirely and become consolidated as a clique. For Musk's idea of Twitter being a public square vital to a functioning democracy to work, we can only assume that Musk would like Twitter's user base to accurately represent their respective communities. Since Musk lives in the United States and his ideas for Twitter's content moderation are based on normative American values, let's see how Twitter stacks up to the rest of the country. According to Pew Research data from 2021, only 23% of American adults use Twitter, as opposed to 81% for YouTube and 69% for Facebook. Beyond that, a separate data set from 2019 revealed that Twitter users were younger, wealthier, and more likely to be Democrats compared to the American public. Roughly 80% of tweets from the US came from only 10% of the user base. Twitter users were underrepresented in several key demographics, including those who lack a high school education, make $30,000 or less a year, and Hispanic and black people, which coincidentally are the same demographics that are less likely to have access to home broadband internet. Twitter's usefulness as a platform for political deliberation is inherently limited because its user base underrepresents key demographics of the American population. Purchasing Twitter in the name of democracy seems a little bit like a putting the cart before the horse situation, because no matter how free the speech is on Twitter, the site already isn't representing a significant portion of Americans. A more useful route Musk could have taken is advocating for increasing Americans' access to broadband internet. using his considerable means and platform to support legislation like the Build Back Better Act, which would devote billions of dollars to expanding broadband access for America. Uh, and uh, Musk was vehemently against it. Democracies. Habermas and his contemporaries also argue that a certain level of quality must be present in the discussions to have productive political outcomes. If the end goal is to have political deliberation that serves a functioning democracy, as we must assume Elon's intention is, a platform that encourages nuanced conversations seems necessary. While deliberation over social media platforms will generally be less nuanced than real life communication, there are degrees. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Twitter has a 280 character limit. While I won't downplay the importance Twitter has had in certain political movements, the platform does leave something to be desired when it comes to the quality of conversation. Twitter's design inherently limits how much nuance a conversation can have. The platform incentivizes users to fire off half-formed thoughts on stories as they develop in real time. A 2021 study on social media outrage, which specifically focused on Twitter, highlighted a sort of outrage feedback loop that Twitter incentivizes. Outrage tweets were more likely to get engagement, giving the tweeter that sweet dopamine hit of likes and comments, making it more likely that they would tweet outrage in the future. Likewise, users were more likely to engage with an outrage tweet, so more outrage tweets were likely to show up on their home page. Even if fueling outrage was never Twitter's intention, the consequence of creating an algorithm that favors engagement inevitably leads to boosting the most outrageous tweets to the top. All the while, we're getting further and further away from more measured and politically useful deliberation. While these factors are true for basically any form of social media, Twitter does seem to be especially apt at fostering an environment for imprecise outrage. 
the speed at which tweets trend and die off, the character limit, and the nature of social media's positive outrage feedback loop make it all but inevitable that any regular user with a moderate following will eventually throw out a take that is either half-baked or gets interpreted in the least charitable way possible. I mean, when's the last time you watched a video about a content creator controversy that, at some point, didn't include the phrase, and then they posted this tweet. This is an aspect of Twitter that can't be fixed with content moderation or new monetization practices. It's inherent to Twitter. It does make me wonder why, if Musk really did want to create a public square that is vital to a functioning democracy, he decided to purchase a platform with such inherent limitations, rather than create a new one like he teased. Now, like I mentioned earlier, these are ideals. Frankly, it would be ridiculous and basically impossible to expect any social media platform to rigidly adhere to Habermas's criteria. But I do think it's telling that many of Musk's solutions and the very platform he chose either don't contribute to or actively work against fostering an environment for useful political discussion. Now, I'm not here to say I have the answers. I don't. But the conversation around free speech and social media is often reductive, and it becomes really easy to lose sight of why we even value free speech in the first place. Basically, this shit is complicated and requires a lot of nuance, which Musk's solutions for free speech on Twitter lack. Generally, Twitter remains neutral as to the content because our general counsel and CEO like to say that we are the free speech wing of the free speech party. This is a quote from former Twitter executive Tony Wang during a conference in 2012. This may come as a surprise to Musk and the 14-year-old slash Ben Shapiro's who idolize him, but Twitter was actually founded on strictly adhering to American free speech values. In fact, early Twitter closely resembled what Musk's ideal for the platform is, and its initial set of rules, which the site operated with from 2009 to 2015, only limited speech that directly called for specific threats of violence and anything that broke the law. Twitter prided itself on being the free speech platform, even highlighting that aspect as a reason Twitter stood out against its competitors. So what happened? Well, first we have to draw a distinction between what the First Amendment protects and what sites like Twitter do when they moderate content. The protection of free speech in the First Amendment pertains to punishment from the state. It means the KKK can protest on public property without the fear of the state coming to arrest them because of what they say. Because of the extremely high consequences of, you know, being arrested for saying something, there are very few limitations on protected speech. So, what happens when you allow that broad spectrum of speech to exist on a social media platform? Well, it turns out that trying to obtusely apply the First Amendment to a mass communication tool that wouldn't even be conceivable by the Founding Fathers doesn't work. A quick dive into supposed free speech platforms like Parler, 8chan, and Gab reveals similar stumbling points. All these sites' lax moderation policies inevitably lead to them being taken over by neo-Nazis, racists, and far-right extremists. This inherently limits the platform's user base, cause it turns out the only people who like being around Nazis are other Nazis. At its most popular, Parler's 20 million users paled in comparison to Twitter's 200 million and didn't even compare to Facebook or YouTube's billion plus. Despite being helmed as a platform for free speech and a haven for Trump supporters, Trump's own Twitter following was four times as big as Parler's entire user base. Because it turns out, despite the cries from conservatives over censorship and free speech, even the majority of them can't handle coming face to face with the, uh super bigotry that these sites have to offer. Go figure. It turns out that a lot of the societal pressures that keep people from talking about being a Nazi in real life don't exist when they're hiding behind a computer. While Twitter never got as bad as some of these other sites, they did face several stumbling blocks as a result of their free speech policies. Perhaps most famously was the role the site played in Gamergate. 
The targeted harassment against gaming industry figures like Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian is arguably the defining moment in Twitter's history with content moderation. While Gamergate started on sites like 4chan and spread to every corner of the internet, Twitter played a vital role in as much as it was the most lax with its moderation of the big three social media platforms. In many ways, Twitter ended up being the central platform for Gamergate, and the site's design and moderation policies made it extremely easy to to organize and facilitate targeted harassment campaigns. But beyond the death threats and doxing, something truly insidious was happening. Something Twitter executives couldn't stand by. Twitter's growth began to stagnate. While Twitter has always lagged behind competitors like Facebook and YouTube, from 2014 to 2017 they saw a level of stagnation that wasn't in line with broader social media trends. Their quarterly growth plummeted, even going in the red for most of 2017, and year-to-year -year growth was almost non-existent. So what did Gamergate have to do with Twitter stagnation? There's a concept known as the heckler's veto, which has both a legal definition as it pertains to American free speech laws and a colloquial definition. Colloquially, a heckler's veto refers to a situation where one party's speech is effectively silenced by another party without legal intervention. The First Amendment legally allows me to go into a bar filled with Hell's Angels and openly talk shit about the Hell's Angels, but despite the fact that my speech is legally protected by the law and I'm not a fan of the Hell's Angels, I will keep my fucking mouth shut in the Hell's Angels bar because they will hurt me physically. Likewise, we can apply the concept of the heckler's veto to online speech. Parler's CEO may claim that he wants liberals to join the platform, but when posting something contrary to the Parler user base's conservative consensus gets a swarm of racial slurs and death threats, it decreases the likelihood of people being open about those ideas in those spaces. When saying something as benign as video games can sometimes perpetuate sexist stereotypes leads to years of targeted harassment, people with those views are going to be less likely to use your platform. Eventually, as Gamergators became a dominant vocal minority on Twitter, users with contrary or more moderate positions began to leave the platform. This prompted Twitter to increase their moderation policies as a means to both appease advertisers and persuade users to stay on the platform. This is why tweets like this are so tone deaf. Musk claiming that he wants Twitter to be neutral and the way to achieve that goal is by loosening up the site's rules is an inherent contradiction. When it comes to online content moderation, deciding to do nothing isn't a neutral choice. It's a choice in favor of extremist ideologies that inevitably become the norm on a platform without moderation. And maybe Musk would say, so be it. If people choose to leave the platform, that's on them. And the platform itself shouldn't be making decisions about speech. That's a sound argument in and of itself, but if Musk truly wants Twitter to be a platform for a useful political discussion, if he really thinks it's central to a functioning democracy, then I can't see how an unmoderated social media site filled with bigotry and hate speech would be of service to that goal. I guess I'm just not a visionary like he is. Honestly, I don't think Musk wants Twitter to be overrun with white supremacists, even though he retweets them. But it has nothing to do with Musk's political beliefs or free speech ideals. Why do you think Elon Musk has gained a reputation as the real-life Iron Man? It's because he invented all this crazy, innovative technology, right? Well, no, not exactly. We call him Iron Man because a series of smart PR moves led to Robert Downey Jr. sitting down with Musk in preparation for the first film, which, in turn, led to several more good PR stories about Musk being the inspiration for Tony Stark. Musk is a serial entrepreneur who's really fucking good at marketing his image. He's more Steve Jobs than Tony Stark. Where Musk excels is his ability to take existing companies and ideas and coming up with a successful business strategy. The investors that he got help from in his Twitter deal even stated that they loaned him money based on his reputation, not because his ideas for Twitter were salient. This is why Musk can't make Twitter a platform that abides by his free speech absolutist values. 
That kind of platform would not reach the mainstream success that Musk has promised to his investors. While he could turn Twitter into a niche free speech social media website, the devaluing of the company that would inevitably happen would likely irreparably damage his reputation and make his future business dealings more difficult. We've seen time and time again that Musk's ideals come second to his personal and economic interests. Twitter is no different. If Musk's Twitter deal goes through, he'll have two mutually exclusive options. Appease the investors that gave him billions of dollars to make Twitter more profitable, or appease the fringe supposed free speech absolutists who want Twitter to be a no-holds-barred form for basically all types of ideas. I wonder which one he'll choose.